My name is Ellen Kelsey and I teach in the Masters of Environmental Education and Communications program at Royal Roads University in Canada and I also work on a research team at Stanford University and at James Cook University in Australia. Um, my project that I'm working on here at the Rachel Carson Centre is really looking at how do we move environmental narratives beyond doom and gloom towards more hopeful, resilient, um, more engaging solutions oriented approaches. For lots and lots of years I've been involved in conservation projects and sustainability projects, a lot of them in the marine environment, and looking at ways that people engage with those kinds of issues. And one of the things that I've found in my work interviewing uh, children and interviewing conservation biologists and environmental educators is that there is a real um, strong emotional reaction to how we perceive the state of the planet. And that can be fear, it can be despair, it can be um, genuine anxiety, a feeling that things are really messed up. And that is proving through conservation psychology literature to be a real barrier to people's ability to, to enact a more sustainable future. So I, I guess what I'm realizing and, and what really drives me in my work is that we need to think about the narratives and the emotional implications of the stories that we tell about the state of the planet and be more creative and more open to alternative kinds of narratives that leave us feeling empowered and engaged and, and feeling like we really can enact the kind of futures that we're interested in having. So for example, um, really recent work on the idea that trees um, are not individual entities but are in fact part of social networks and that when a mother tree, some of the largest trees in the forest, when those mother trees are, are dying, they actually actively pass along their energy to the other components of their network, so to younger trees and other plants in the forest. In my most recent book, You Are Stardust, I really wanted to address this issue of uh, this sense of disconnection between children and the environment. And I wanted to do that by saying, you know, we really are just nature. Whether you're sitting in a car seat or you're sitting in the middle of a forest, you know, your hair falls like autumn leaves. When you exhale, you blow out pollen that may become a flower. You are intimately connected to nature. And those ideas of intimate connection are ones that astronomers are currently working with and we as environmental communicators are working with. One of the challenges in environmental humanities has been this kind of privileging of science so that we tend to think, oh, if we have a, an expert coming from a scientific viewpoint, they have more credibility or more weight in terms of their influence on environmental decision making. And what I think is really remarkable about the, the concept of the emotional landscape of environmental issues is that they are a perfect ground in which to look at the role of humanities because humanities helps us to understand the history that brought us to these feelings. It helps us to understand the social construction of our culture that reinforces those feelings. It helps us to understand the psychology underneath those feelings. And I think without that, we are destined to just keep replaying over and over again these stories of despair because we haven't critically analyzed why we feel the way we do. We just look at the evidence that supports how we feel uh, coming to us from uh, information about climate change or information about loss of species or any of these other very important science-based environmental issues. So for me, this field of emotions is the perfect place by which humanities and um, biological sciences come together in a very productive way to change the way we can live on this earth.